This interview came out after Andy Schaaf released his new album, Norm. He actually spoke a lot more about his songwriting process and creative process than I believe he has in previous interviews. Let's just get right into it, see what we can gather, any information, any cool techniques, songwriting techniques, and just talk a little bit about that. I analyze it, um, react to it, and yeah. Andy Schaff is a songwriter from Saskatchewan originally, and he's become one of my favorite uh, contemporary songwriters of today. So really cool. I did get to meet him once um, when he did his release of the Neon Skyline. I met him at the Skyline. Really cool guy. Um, I was pretty shy, so I didn't really speak to him as much as I would have liked to. But yeah, just... I uh, really appreciate his music and wanted to give him, give his songwriting a bit of a analysis, not really analysis, more just discussion about it. So let's listen to what he has to say. We talked about, I think you, you mentioned uh, in, in another interview I read, something about wanting to, to approach the music in a different way, uh, more melody driven as opposed to chord driven. Um, how, how did that, how, how did you approach that going in? I mean, is it a matter of sitting down to write at, at the piano instead of the guitar or with the clarinet instead or, or, or what? How did you sort of get into that? What frame of mind? Yeah, it was kind of, it was pretty much just putting the guitar down and sitting at the piano. Mm. I think what really opened it up for me was I did this sort of gear, it was like a gear challenge where this company wanted people to try out a synthesizer, and so I tried out the synthesizer, and I wrote this, I wrote Telephone, actually, <clears throat> starting it with the, the synth melody. And what I, I had been writing a lot on guitar, Neon Skyline was all written on guitar, and what I was finding was that I was lacking a lot of space musically, the guitar just has so much rhythm built into it, um, where you're kind of, you're, yeah, it's all rhythm, it's all chord structure. You're placing a melody on top of those chords. You can change the chords, but you're kind of, it gets a little too rigid. And when I was writing on the synth and melodies on piano, I was finding that in figuring out how to support them after the fact, there was a lot more space left over and you could kind of support things where you wanted to and leave space where you wanted to. And it was an important reminder to me to leave space in the music because I didn't realize how busy I was starting to make things and space was always really important. So he's talking about how by changing the instrument that he's using initially to write a song, he's allowing there to be more space in the composition, so space in, in the song itself. And I can see what he means because when you start off by writing on a guitar, let's say you go with acoustic guitar, which is usually tends to be songwriter's choice. Um, just because it's easy, it's usually a popular instrument to learn how to play, especially if you're a newer songwriter, and it's also just easy to start. But So when you start songwriting on a guitar, especially if you're going with, with the chords first, like creating a chord progression, it just becomes, like he said, very rhythm-driven, and... If you ever notice that when you go to then record that demo for that song, something I've noticed to myself is that when you're just playing it at home and you're just listening, it's like, oh yeah, it sounds cool, it sounds great, but then when you go to record it, I've noticed that the guitar tends to dominate this song. So the rhythm of the guitar, the changes of the chords, it tends to dominate and then everything else that you then add on top it's kind of like just adding to the noise and like he said it sounds busy 
And this is something I've noticed with my own like songwriting process is that I've gone and then recorded songs with guitar and singing and then when I go to then add like other instrumentation, for example, I want to add strings to two of my songs. It's like, okay, well, where is the space for those strings then? Where's the space to add and whatever else that I want to add, like the synths or uh, bass. It's almost like the guitar just dominates the space. So why is it important for there to be space in a song? Um, and I think this is something that Andy Schaff has talked about in another interview, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember where I heard this or where I've seen it. I think he talked about uh, how Neil Young has quite a bit of space in some of his songs and how that creates a different effect. I know that in a lot of like popular music today, there isn't much space, at least that, that I've noticed. It's sort of like, it's busy, it's catchy, it, it like sounds cool, but there is something to say about having space in music, space to breathe, space for other instruments to come in. But I think, I think in his song Telephone, I can hear how there is a lot more space. And the first time I heard it, I just remember if it, it sounds a lot slower. It almost sounds like it's in slow motion, but it's not particularly slower, I would say. I think it's the fact that there's so much space in that song that when you listen to it, it does really like slow you down. Um, and you really, it forces you to really listen and hear because it's slowed down and there's more space. The sounds that you do hear in the song, they do stand out more and you're able to actually listen to the melody and the melody itself is what becomes the main part of that song um and i see that in his other songs on his new album norm more so than songs in the past there are some past songs that he does have a lot of space and he has more space in his music than other artists because it's clearly important to him um yeah but let's keep listening to see what else what other stuff we can get, gather from this. But I really, really like the idea of not starting on a guitar. At least if, the, if, if you're interested in adding more space to your music, which I'm currently trying to do, trying to add more space and flow, and like flow rather than busyness and just taking up too much of the listener's ear, rather focusing on the melody. So what else can we gather from this? It wasn't like you were doing bebop or anything, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. it is true that, that I think Miles Davis famously said, it's all the notes you don't play, right? And that's, 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 and it, it, again, it makes a perfect parallel with, with the spaces you're leaving in the narrative and in the lyrics. So it, it kind of all fits together really nicely. Um, I think I read somewhere that you mentioned Mulholland Drive having an impact on this. And I mean, I can sort of see that in terms of uh, mood and again, narrative voices and, and characters kind of being blurry. Um, is there more to it beyond that? It was, uh, yeah, I was watching, I was at a point in the story where I didn't know how to end it. I didn't know how much to give away. I didn't know how much I wanted to tie it together neatly so that it was well understood who was talking and what had happened. And I was watching Mulholland Drive and it came to this scene where there's a key sitting on a table and the frame just kind of like stopped and it looked like it was really slowly zooming in. And I watched it for a few minutes thinking like, wow, this is, this key is really significant to the whole thing and this is such a slow zoom and then it was like three minutes and then it was like five minutes and i was thinking wow this must have been like chaos and eaters like people would have been so confused and it's building so much tension and then my browser just crashed and i've been watching just a frozen movie for about five minutes giving all the significance to it and it was 
it was nice because I mean it was funny I laughed at myself and felt uh, like an idiot but it was good at the time because it showed me that there is a lot to a story that is up to interpretation and if I if I don't want to end the story neatly I don't have to so that I found that story hilarious that he is watching this movie and not realizing that his browser was actually just frozen. He thinks that the scene is just this, the key, the keys, and it's just like a close up and it's like not moving and it's like must be so significant. And in a way, it sort of like tricked him into thinking that there is something super important about this one shot right but in the end it was just frozen but what he took from that is how you don't need to give everything when you're telling a story when you're telling a story whether it's in a song or in other types of writing you don't need to give everything away you don't need to make the ending or conclusion super clear and you don't need you definitely don't need to be like spoon feeding people but i think this is what a lot of songs nowadays do it's all very clear all very um if there's a story it's there's never any question about what it is like he, <laughs> i think he's doing something that you see more in short story writing or like in let's say like horror or mystery novels or you know because there is a creepy element to this album where the ending isn't clear and it doesn't have to be and you do see this in like art films or films that are perhaps less less well taken by mainstream um, audiences, but it's not so much in popular film or song, but I like the idea that it's open for interpretation. And the other thing about Andy that's quite unique in his songwriting is his use of storytelling. And you can see how he's taking it to a different level, or at least, you know, he's doing something different here by telling a story that is pretty much open to interpretation and you know I like when you read the comments under his songs it'll say you know like what a sweet love song or another comments will say well that's creepy and you know because it, it was meant to be up for interpretation um and I think that's I think that's really cool I think that's a unique way to go about it and I don't know if I've seen too much of that in in music nowadays. Like the album, when you listen to it start to finish, it reads more like a short story um, or something like that where you, you're not quite sure what just happened, but you enjoyed the process, you enjoyed the ride. So, or something like a movie where you, like, it sounded beautiful. It sounded... I love the sounds of this album. I definitely felt more jazzy influences. Um, I felt like Nick Drake influences. I felt Beatles. I heard a lot of Beatles sounds in there. I felt uh, Paul McCartney coming through. I even felt a little bit of Paul Simon coming through in Halloween Store specifically. Um, there were just a lot of things coming through on this album, but the thing that I got, like, that particularly uh, stood out to me is that we were kind of tricked. <laughs> I feel almost as if we were pranked by Andy Schaff. Andy kind of tricked us in a playful way, the way he released his first three songs of Norm, because the first song is like this fun social commentary on religion. Um, it's not offensive, but it's still kind of like poking fun lightly. And then you hear Catch Your Eye, which is like vaguely creepy, but still sweet. And then Telephone, again, coming across as like a sweet romantic song. But if you listen closely, it's actually kind of like dark and a bit weird about this person that just like 
watching someone while trying to call them on the phone. But so, but then as the album comes out, you realize like these are love songs, but they're kind of written from the perspective of kind of a stalker kind of vibe. So it's like unrequited love. It's still love, love songs, but it's creepy and it, it was meant to be that way. So he's telling a story, but he's doing it. Even the way he released the songs were kind of like how he saw that key frozen on the screen where it, it left it open for us to interpret. And even after listening to the whole album, not quite sure what happens, what happens to the characters, who are the characters, you know, is God one of the characters? And it's all sort of left to our interpretation. So make what you will of it. But another thing I wanted to listen to is he talks about his actual songwriting process. So let's have a listen here. My process lately is that I work on something until I get stuck. And then in a really practical way, I make a whole list of the songs. And I start at the top and I put a check mark beside it when I get stuck. And then I move on to the next one, work on it until I'm stuck. And I kind of just keep going down the list until it's until I feel like I'm I have nothing more to, to change on them. It's kind of a really practical way to just keep momentum because you can do it where you are recording all the drums at once or all the piano at once but at a certain point you just start like not phoning it in but you start to get tired of that process and start to repeat yourself so i find that just opening something first impression what do i need to do do that if you don't find anything else to do move on to the next okay so i personally will be using his advice here. I know it's not advice, but I'm going to be taking it as advice as a songwriter myself. And I love the idea of his process, the way it works. So he he's taking songs, he's going into, let's say, whatever he uses. I use Ableton Live. So he's going into his digital audio workstation He's going into his DAW, he's going into his DAW, he's working on the song, but he's using first impressions. And I think this is one of the best ways to go about doing it because if you try to go like piecemeal, piece by piece, you get focused on perfectionism. And I think it gets too easy to get stuck uh, in trying to make things all perfect. Better to go with first impressions, do something when you're stuck leave it, tick it off, go to the next song, go to the next bit, and then when you're done, you can come back, see if there's anything else that needs to be added. And I think, I think it sounds like he's come to this process just through a lot of experience of recording and a lot of music production experience. And I think this is not something that I've done, I've, <laughs> but it seems very intuitive, the idea of just going with first impressions and then once you're stuck, leaving it, going to the next and then coming back. Because otherwise you're going to get stuck on trying to make things just right, just perfect, and it no longer becomes intuitive. He's a songwriter that has sort of perfected the art of a music production side, which is, I think, somewhat rare at least nowadays for songwriters for the songwriter to also be like pretty experienced with the production and recording side so what we can gather from that is that we can create more space in our music by changing up the instruments that we use especially take moving away from songwriting on guitar moving to more piano keys synth or other things we can make our process more intuitive by going with first impressions rather than you know strong arming uh, he uses this word in in the interview but like strong arming ideas when we're actually recording instruments or adding other instruments 
to a song. To be honest, I just I get the sense that he's also come to the conclusion himself, whether through experience or through, you know, learning the learning process, that it's way better to go with your intuition when you're writing a song, when you're producing it, rather than forcing ideas. So I have a pretty quick this is going to work or this is not going to work. I'll write down a million notes of things that I can do and as I try them, it's kind of immediately obvious if something's gonna work or not. So, because Andy Schaaf has extensive experience with recording on his own, like completely alone, uh, I think that's why he has developed this songwriting ability and I think it is an intuitive process for him now. It really is first impressions. Sometimes we'll go into a song and we're like, okay, the song is not sounding so great. You know, something's a bit off. And we'll try to like force ideas. But I like that he, when he notices that it doesn't fit or, you know, he just cuts it off right there. You know, try it, doesn't fit, doesn't sound right. Nope. We're not doing that. I think we can gather that it's better to just stick to what feels right. And I like, in terms of like the actual logistics of it, I like the idea of having a list of your songs and, you know, taking off once you've gotten to a point where you can't add anymore, you can't fix anything, then you know the song is done. But you don't need to finish it all in one go either. You can always come back to it. But it's just about sitting, listening, and seeing if it feels right, do it. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. So the other thing that Andy did differently, I don't know how he's done other albums, but is that he, he wrote the songs and they, he intended them to be just normal songs. He actually didn't intend for this to be a concept album. And so it's interesting because it ended up kind of becoming one anyway. Um, and I wonder if it's, that's just because just the way things worked out. But what's cool is that he didn't intend for it this time. So the result of the album is it does sound a lot more spacious it does sound a lot more floaty and flowing. You don't feel the sense of like uh, someone telling you a story very like directly. It's more like these songs are, you know, vaguely connected and musically connected, but it's open for how you choose to interpret it. I like that he chose to have another person, an editor, come in and work on his music storytelling with him because it does help to have like another set of eyes, another set of ears to see how others might interpret your music and your story. It's really helpful to have another person to listen. And that's something that I've struggled with sometimes is, is you know, I can get very like attached to lyrics or, or you know, the songwriting. Um, and so something I'm taking away as well is, you know, it's okay to get another fresh set of ears or eyes on your creations, you know? So editing, Deanna is here and I just wanted to add that what I think Andy Schaaf does so differently and does so well is that when you listen to his music, the melody actually takes front and center stage, which is kind of unique and I think unique for modern songwriters nowadays. I think that he's also able to amplify this effect by focusing on adding more space to his compositions. And this is something that if you'd like to create an effect where the melody actually is more important and the driving force, 
it can actually help you to focus on space as a good starting point. And really listening to this interview helped me understand that even more. Uh, it's something that I was like, well, how how do I get that sound? You know, where he he has there's a sound in his songs that feels floaty and it almost feels like you're floating around a room listening to this story kind of like observing from up above you get the sense that you're looking down on these characters you know going about their lives doing their thing but you get to watch from far and i think that seeing his songwriting process in that interview kind of helped me understand how he's creating more space and this allows the melody to drive the songs rather than the rhythm and the chord progression and this is different from stuff that i've talked about before because if you recall my elliot smith video he talks about the use of chord progressions to write a song and that was the way he song wrote but if you listen to Elliot Smith's songs, there is actually less space because the chord progressions of the guitar do take up a lot of the dominant space in his songs. Not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but it's a different style. And if you'd like to create more space in your music, this is one way you can do it, is by changing up your instruments that you song right with but also just keeping in mind space in composition and how sometimes less is more. And that's what we get from Andy Schaff's interview. So thank you so much for watching and for subscribing to my channel. If you haven't, please take a second to click the subscribe because I really love music. I know you guys do too because you keep coming back for more songwriters where I will be analyzing how they've done their songwriting process, take a look at any little gems of wisdom that some songwriters can give us, and also just talk about music and creativity in general. If this is something you're into, please like and subscribe, and also leave a comment below if you have any thoughts on this yourself or any bit of wisdom or ideas of what you'd like to see next you guys rock and i'll see you guys next time